Hello, I'm Dev Poodle. Today I'll be giving you a short guide on compute shaders, more specifically how to use them in Godot. Compute shaders are an incredibly useful tool in that they allow you to massively speed up parts of your game or process a ton of data in the background. The idea is fairly simple. GPUs are pretty great, they can do hundreds or depending on your hardware, thousands of different operations all at the same time. Originally, all this power was meant for processing pixel data or other sort of graphics data, hence the name GPU. But you might think, hey, couldn't we use this to process basically any large amount of data instead? Well, that's what computers are for. You can think of it like multi-threading taken to the extreme. Instead of a single threaded CPU, you can have literally a thousand threads on the GPU, with the caveat that each thread is quite a lot slower, of course. So, using compute traders in Godot. Godot first exposed compute trader functionality in 4.0, which was, huh, only two years ago. Feels like it's been longer. Well, anyway, Godot's compute trader API can be quite confusing. I know that when I first began using it, I was just constantly getting frustrated and running into bugs I had zero clue on how to solve. Hopefully this guide will spare you some of that struggle and teach you something new, even if you've used compute shaders before. So in Godot, the compute shader API is all just a subset of the rendering device API. This API is typically meant for more experienced programmers, but whether you're experienced or not, you'll have to brace through it in order to use compute shaders. To get access to it, call renderingserver.getRenderingDevice. I'd recommend storing this in a variable because it is quite a mouthful. Uh, so from now on, whenever you see lowercase rd, just remember it's a global rendering device. So before we get to doing anything with compute shaders, I should explain a bit about how a rendering device works. Rendering device is Godot's abstraction of lower level graphics APIs like OpenGL and Vulkan. Because these lower level APIs often work quite differently, everything in rendering device is stored as an abstract object called an RID or rendering ID. These are the objects Godot internally uses for keeping track of stuff like shaders, textures, and other rendering-related data. To use rendering device well, you have to keep good track of all the RIDs you've created and where they're being passed. This is obviously useful for writing good code in general, but it's especially important for memory management. Because, unlike almost every other object in Godot, RIDs are not freed automatically. To free the memory associated with an RID, you have to call rendering device.freeRID and then pass in the object you want to delete. If you, for example, create a new RID every frame in the process function, and then forget to call free RID, you'll cause a memory leak, causing your game to get continuously slower as it runs, and an inevitable crash once too much memory builds up. So hopefully you understand why this is so important. Mismanaged RIDs are one of the easiest ways to mess up when using rendering device. I just want to make sure that's uh, not a mistake you make yourself. With the basic explanation of rendering device out of the way, we can get into actually making some compute shaders. First, we need to load in a shader file. I'll load from a file called computeshader.glsl. Don't worry, I don't expect you to have a finished shader yet, this is just a placeholder path for now. In the next chapter, I'll show you how to write a glsl shader from scratch. To create a shader RID, we then need to call rd.shadercreatefromspearv and pass in our shader file .getspearv. From this shader, we can then create a compute pipeline by calling compute pipeline create. You don't have to know exactly what a compute pipeline represents, it's just something we'll have to pass to a function later on, so make sure you have it. So we're about halfway done with initialization. We have our shader file loaded, but we don't have any uniform data yet. When using compute shaders, uniforms refers to the data that gets passed in and out of a shader. For the most part, when you're dealing with compute shaders in Godot, uniform data is almost always either going to be stored as a storage buffer for regular data or a texture for image data. Creating a storage buffer is fairly easy. You just create a packed byte array with the data you want and then call storage buffer create with the data size and then the data itself. In the example shader I'll be writing later, I'll want to pass in a storage buffer with three floats, so I'll create a packed float array, and then just convert it to a packed byte array when creating the storage buffer. Creating a texture will require a little more work. First, you need to create an image. For this example, I'm loading in this quick doodle I made in Krita. To make sure it's in the right format, convert it to RGBAF. Next, we need to create an RD texture view and RD texture format object. The view object can just be whatever the default RD texture view is. The texture format object has a few settings we need to change though. So after creating a new RD texture format, first set its width and height to the width and height of the image you're using. Then set its format to the format of your image. My image is an RGBAF, so this is the corresponding RD texture format. Finally, you need to tell Godot how you're going to use this texture. I want to be able to use this as a storage image, be able to copy it back to the CPU, and be able to sample with it, so these are the flags I'm going with. If you want to see what other options there are, look through the texture usage bit flags on the page for rendering devices documentation. Now we can actually create the texture by calling texture create and passing in the texture format 
texture view, and image data. Here's how it looks like in the script. So we now have our shader and uniforms fully initialized. If this were a shader you want to run multiple times, everything we've written so far would have been in a ready function. Now we can get to actually running the shader. First, we create a uniform set. This first parameter will eventually be an array of all our uniforms, but we'll have to get to that later. The second and third parameters are our compute shader and the uniform set's index. We're only going to have one uniform set, so the index should be set to zero. Then we create a compute list. A compute list groups together our shader, uniform sets, and all other information related to how we want the shader to run. Now we need to just bind it all together. First, find the compute pipeline we created earlier. Next, find the uniform set we just created and pass in the set index you decided on earlier. If you also wanted to pass in a push constant, then you would call this function, which shakes in the push constant as a packed byte array and its size. Finally, we can dispatch the shader, causing it to actually run, and then end the compute list. These last three numbers in the dispatch function represent the amount of work groups we want our shader to work on. Actually, I probably should go over what a work group is first. Let's say you want to process an image with a million pixels in it, and you want your shader to run once for each pixel. Your GPU may only actually be able to process a thousand different threads at a time, so you have to manually tell it how to split up the million pixels such that there's only a thousand threads being run at any given time. Each of these collections are known as work groups. Our compute shader contains information about how many threads each work group has, and then when you dispatch the shader, like we just did in our script, you say how many work groups there should be in total. When the GPU runs the shader, it will then go over each work group sequentially, running all the threads in that group at the same time, and then when they're all finished, move on to the next group. You may be a bit confused then about why we specify three separate numbers when telling the GPU how many work groups we want to run. The easiest way to think about this is like a heavily nested for loop. Each number represents how many times we want one of the loops to run. Then inside of the loop, we do the same thing, another nested loop, this time for the amount of threads each work group should have. Hopefully this explanation of workgroups has been understandable. I know it's uh, a bit rambly, but uh, I couldn't really think of a better way to describe it. Let's use this knowledge to decide how many workgroups we want our shader to have. The image I'm processing has a resolution of 1024 by 1024. Let's say I want 32 by 32 by 1 threads per workgroup. If we divide 1024 by 32, we get back 32. So in order to get our shader to run for each pixel image, we must have 32 by 32 by 1 workgroups. Again, you can multiply this all together and you get 1024 by 1024. There's not really an exact science to how many threads you want to have per work group. The best way to find out is just by testing the performance of your shader with different amounts until you find a decent spot. But I won't be doing that for this video, it really depends on your specific hardware. All right, we are so, so close to being done with our script. The last thing we need to do is go back where we created our uniform set and actually fill in the uniforms we want to send. The array being passed when we create the set is an array of RD uniforms. Each RD uniform corresponds to some amount of data we're going to be sending to the GPU. First, we'll create an RD uniform that corresponds to the storage buffer we created earlier. You do this by creating an RD uniform, specifying its type, in this case a storage buffer, its binding, which is essentially a unique index each uniform has to have, and then add the ID of the storage buffer itself. Next, we have to create an RD uniform for our image. This is almost the exact same thing as a storage buffer, except it's an image type, has a different binding, and we're passing in the texture ID. Finally, add both new uniforms to the uniform set array. We're now actually finished with the script. We can get to writing the compute shader that we've been trying to run. As of right now, Godot only supports GLSL compute shaders. GLSL is a very C-like language, but even if you've never used C before, you probably have some familiarity with it, because Godot's shading language is heavily based on GLSL. And by heavily based on, I mean it's basically the exact same. So if you've ever written a shader in Godot, you shouldn't have too much trouble acclimating to GLSL. Now comes the annoying part. Godot doesn't allow you to write GLSL using the in-engine text editor, so you'll have to pick something else to write your compute shader with. GLSL is all just in plain text, so you could use Notepad or whatever your OS's equivalent is. I personally use VS Code, but honestly it doesn't matter much, I haven't found any IDEs especially good with GLSL. So just pick whatever you're most comfortable with. So instead of writing a shader from scratch, I'll start off with this fairly default empty shader. I'll go through this line by line, explaining what each part of it does. This first line is Godot specific. It tells the engine to load this file in as a compute shader. The second line specifies what version of GLSL we're using. If you don't know about any specific versions or the differences, then feel free to just go with version 450, it should work completely fine on most computers. Next we have this layout line. Remember back when I was explaining work groups and how each work group contained a certain amount of threads? Well these local size variables are how many threads each work group has. I already decided that I would have 32 by 32 by 1 threads per group, so that's why I've written here. Finally, we have the main function. 
This is where all of our shader code actually happens. Right now it's completely empty, but we'll make it do something else in just a moment. First, we still have to specify what uniforms this shader expects to be receiving. The first uniform we passed in is the storage buffer. To pass this in, we first need to specify its layout. It's in uniform set 0, and its binding is 0, we set both of these earlier in our script. Then we say what format the data is in. Our data is going to follow standard 430. This standard tells GLSL how to interpret the byte data we sent in earlier as separate variables. If you have a ton of different values being sent into one storage buffer, then this can get quite confusing, but since we're only sending in three floats, it should be fairly simple. Then we say this is a layout for a read-only storage buffer, and name the buffer. If you want to be able to change values in this buffer, you can remove the read-only keyword. Or, if this buffer is only going to serve as an output, you can add the write-only keyword. Finally, we can specify what data the buffer will contain. I'm passing in three floats that I'll call R, G, and V. At the end here, you can then specify a shorter name that you'll use to access the buffer in your main function. I'll call mine params. Next, we have to specify our image uniform. The layout section is almost the exact same, with the binding and set we use in our script. Instead of standard 430, we're saying our image uses an RGBA 32F format. Then we say that's a uniform image 2D and name it. With our uniforms done, we can write the actual code we want to run. First, how do we get a unique pixel for each time the shader runs? Well, in the main function, we get access to a variable called GL Global Indication ID. Let's go back to the for loop example I showed earlier to see what this represents. So, we have these six layers of for loops. We can merge them into just three for loops by multiplying the sizes together. GL Global Indication ID is a 3D vector with components x, y, and z from this for loop. We already know all the sizes of each of these constants, so let's replace them with their real values. 32 times 32 equals 1024, which is image size. Since the z value is just 1, we can pretend it's not happening. Now it's pretty clear what the values of GL Global Invocation ID will be. For each invocation of our shader, the ID will represent a unique 2D coordinate corresponding to a pixel in our image. We'll store this in an integer vector 2 called uv in the main function of our shader. Then we want to get the color in our image corresponding to the uv coordinate. We'll store this in a variable called color and sample the image by calling image load and passing in the image uniform in uv. Oh, and if you wanted the size of the image in your shader, GLSL also comes with an image size function you can call. We'll then create a vector for called multiplier and pack all of our storage buffer variables into the x, y, and z values. The final value will just be a 1. We'll multiply the color and multiplier variables together and store it in a vector for called output color. Finally, to write back to the image, use image store, passing in the image, the UV, and the output color. This is our finished shader. It's obviously quite simple, but it should be enough to confirm that all our code is working correctly. Alright, back to Godot. The engine will immediately attempt to load in the shader. You can double click on the shader file to get this bottom panel to pop up. Click on compute. If there are any errors when compiling your shader, a bunch of text will be outputted here saying what the errors are and what lines are on. Assuming there's no errors, we're in the final step of the process now. If you were to run the project, the shader should correctly initialize and then process the image. The problem is we have no way to see it quite yet. To do that, we'll have to go back to our script after we've dispatched the shader. So now we have two main ways to get the output of the shader. First, we can get the image data onto the CPU and save it to a file. Second, we could render out the image to a sprite. Rendering the image out is much faster because all the data is already on the GPU. We just have to pass it to a sprite 2D. I'll go over both methods starting with the first. You can access the image data by calling texture get data and passing in the texture RID. To format it as an image, you can call the image function create from data, passing in the texture size, texture format, and texture data. Finally, to see what the image is, save it to a PNG file called imageoutput.png. Here's the whole process in a script. And here's the result with various different inputs for a storage buffer. It works about as you'd expect. When any of the values are above 1, the corresponding color gets brighter and when any of the values are below 1, the corresponding color gets darker. If this were a shader you only wanted to run one time, this would be a perfectly acceptable way of getting the resulting data. Now for the second method, which allows us to display the image in game without having to first retrieve the data in a script. Do 4.2 introduced the Texture 2D RD type to do exactly this. Create a new Texture 2D RD. Set its Texture RD RID property to your texture. Then set your sprite's texture to the new texture we just created. If this is a method you want to go with, make sure not to free the texture RID. From this point on, texture 2D RID will handle the RID on its own and will free it when it's ready. If you run the project, you should see this result. This is the sprite 2D we're rendering to. Obviously, I've created a little scene around it so you can see what the original sprite looked like. 
We also have these sliders that allow us to change the input values. So if I lower the R value, the image gets less red. If I raise the G value, it gets more green. If I drop the B value completely, the blue goes away entirely. And you know, I could keep changing these around, but you should get the point. This is all in real time and has basically no performance impact because the image is staying on the GPU the whole time. Just like a regular shader that you could apply to the sprite. One last thing, Godot also allows you to get data from the GPU asynchronously. The basic idea is, we want the image data on the CPU, like we did in the first method I showed, but we don't need it right away. Instead of waiting for the data to be fully transferred, we can call texture get data async, a function just recently introduced in Godot 4.4. Like the regular texture get data, we pass in our texture, but then we also pass in a function we've created that takes in a packed byte array parameter. Here's an example of such a function. It takes in the image data, turns it into an image object, and saves it to a PNG, just like how we were doing before. With the main difference that it isn't being called right away. It's going to take a while before the image gets back onto the CPU and it gets saved. You may be curious just how long it will take for this function to be called after we call texture get data async. Well, there's actually a project setting for it. In project settings, make sure advanced settings is enabled. Go to rendering, rendering device, and change frame queue size. This is the number of frames it will take for the rendering device to return the image data. All right, I think that's all I wanted to say in this video. There's definitely more I could talk about. There's quite a bit more about different types of uniforms and what functions GLSL has by default, but that's for a later time. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you learned something valuable from this video and that it helped you in your own projects. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And of course, I'd appreciate it if you liked or subscribed if you found this useful. Also, uh, sorry for the time between uploads. I've been swapping between a bunch of larger projects, so it's been quite difficult to maintain any sort of schedule. Hopefully it'll get better relatively soon. I'm Dev Poodle, uh, I'm really glad you watched this, and goodbye!